Coming up on Digital Music Trends 190, recorded on the 2nd of July 2014, we chat with Impala's Executive Chair Helen Smith about the antitrust complaint over YouTube filed with the European Commission. We also cover Soundrop's new service show.co with the company's Chief Marketing Officer, discuss Google's acquisition of Songza, Ardu's acquisition of Tastemaker X, SoundCloud's redesigned app and RIAA Platinum certifications. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available as an audio and a video show on a variety of channels including the iTunes Store, most podcatching apps, uh, including Downcast, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud and many more. And if you'd like to receive a weekly mail out that lets you know when the shows are coming out and what we talked about each week, uh, then you can sign up on bit.ly slash DMT list and it's just one weekly email with a summary of the shows that went out and this week it's an absolute pleasure to welcome on the show Emmanuel Lucrand, a fantastic music industry journalist uh, uh, that many DMT's listeners will be already familiar with uh, either via the show or through his uh, uh, writing. So hi Emmanuel, thanks for joining us, how's it going? Hello, everything's fine, it's summertime. Yes, it's summertime and uh, unfortunately your video is a little bit scatty so uh, for the viewers of the show uh, pre- uh, bear with us on that. I think it's a connection problem and it's also really great to welcome uh, uh, David Downs, uh, a freelance journalist working for a number of uh, publications and uh, often writing about digital music issues. So hi David and thanks for joining me from uh, is it San Francisco or LA? Yeah, thanks for having me on the show, Andrea. It is also summer here, so that means it's about 50 degrees and foggy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so are you in San Francisco or LA right now? San Francisco. San Francisco, right. Cool. I, I wasn't sure. And uh, it's an absolute pleasure to welcome for the first part of the show the executive chair of uh, Impala, Helen Smith. Uh, so hi, Helen. Thanks for joining us today. How are you? Good, good. It's summer here too. Our summer's very short, not yeah. 50. <laughs> And uh, uh, it's a real pleasure to have you. And of course, uh, uh, this week uh, Impala officially filed, uh, well, actually last week, Impala officially filed its uh, uh, complaint against YouTube based on a uh, breach of competition rules with the European Commission in Brussels. And so it's great to have you. And we're going to chat about that. But uh, first of all, I wanted to ask you a more generic question, I guess, for the listeners that may not be familiar with uh, uh, Impala as an organization. Uh, so what, what, what is Impala and uh, uh, how, how does it operate? Sure. Well, Impala is a trade association and we represent independent music companies across Europe and national associations. Right. And independents are well known for their investment in signing new artists and they account for about 80% of all new releases in Europe today and elsewhere. And our remit has always been very much to look after the interests of the independents and particularly when it comes to the, the digital music market, which they saw as a, as a huge opportunity. Absolutely. And so, uh, first of all, let's talk about this complaint. So what is it all about? Give us an introduction. So, so first of all, this is the closest we'll get to posting it online. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let me nice. see go the right way. <laughs> Well, yeah, because it's confidential, sure. right? Yeah, 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 confidential. But that's it. Give me that. Uh, sorry? Give me that. Yeah, <laughs> give me that, give me that, yeah. And um, we can, well, there is a summary we, we, can, we, can, we can send you at least. Yeah, sure. Um, so the complaint's gone in and it basically sets out five areas of behaviour that, that we think are problematic uh, regarding YouTube's approach to trying to secure rights from the independents to launch its new subscription service. Right. I, mean, I can give you some details about it, but maybe you want to, to, sure, sure, no, to we, launch the discussion first. Absolutely, we, we, can, delve, uh, we can delve into it uh, uh, in, in a second. But uh, in terms of a timeline, so this seems to have happened pretty quickly, you know, uh, literally like four to five weeks time. Uh, uh, yep. as far as the case going public. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, uh, as far as you know, the, the back end of things, uh, is, that, is that something you were concerned with or aware of uh, for longer than that? And, and, and it just came out publicly uh, you know, relatively recently or is it just all kind of developed pretty quickly? I think the whole thing's developed very quickly. I mean, the, the labels that contacted us were concerned that they would have to sign up to these new terms, otherwise they right. would not be able to participate in the new subscription service. And also their current operating terms would would disappear, so they would no longer be able to manage and uh, monetize UGC or other official videos that were associated with, with, with advertising. Yeah. So it, the, 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 the threat and the concern was so great, it did happen very quickly. Yeah. I think, and we and we felt that with the news that the service was about to launch, the complaint itself had to be 
had to be launched very quickly as well. Absolutely. And uh, uh, guys, uh, of course, uh, uh, jump in at uh, any point if you have any other questions. Emmanuel, I'm sure you prepared a, a bunch and, and David as well from your, from your point of view uh, of, you know, somebody that lives in San Francisco. And so, of course, uh, more uh, on, on the tech side uh, uh, of things. Uh, uh, Emmanuel, do you have anything to ask at this point? Well, I, uh, I, Ellen, I w my, my concern is that um, you seem to have had a pretty good relationship so far with, uh, with YouTube. Or uh -huh. am I wrong? And why has it suddenly turned sour? Well, I think that's a good observation. I think a lot of labels would say that there, there is a good relationship there. They would probably query some of the levels of, of remuneration, like, like a lot of labels and artists would, but that the relationship was very good and probably is still very good in there there are there are talks still going on but it was the the very much take it or leave it nature yeah. of the approach and the fact that they were telling us about the level of discrimination with the with the terms and the fact that they were un unacceptable but yet didn't know what to do because of the the level of the threat being that youtube is effectively the world's biggest music service yeah. not to be able to to mo to manage and monetize already what the service is never mind compared never mind looking to the future was something that they felt was really was really serious yeah absolutely and uh, and so uh, you know one of the interesting parts of this is the fact that uh, uh, there is a clause uh, as part of the, the contract, at least the one that was leaked uh, a, f a few weeks mm. ago, uh, that, no, actually uh, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, that talks about uh, essentially a, a, a reverse uh, most favored nation mm. clause, uh, which uh, I, I, th I find particularly controversial because uh, essentially it means that uh, uh, if uh, the rates that YouTube has established with the majors were to go down, uh, the rates uh, that it, it agrees with the, with the independence uh, with that contract would also go down as a consequence. So is that something that was of particular concern, especially given that, uh, you know, on a European level, for example, Universal Music had been uh, pr prevented from requesting most favored nation clauses uh, in its contracts. I know that it's a different issue here because, of course, it wasn't Universal requesting this, but it's it's still a kind of a, a, a tricky situation, right? Yeah, I don't know if someone else wants to answer that, but certainly from our perspective, it was definitely problematic. And as you say, the Commission... Um, prohibited those kind of clauses. I, mean, I think whether it's a most favoured nation or a least favoured nation yeah. doesn't <laughs> exactly. really matter, except that yeah. it, 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 from a PR perspective, it's pretty, a least favoured nation clause is, is, is pretty drastic. Yeah. Yeah, that's why oh, I call no, it a, a reverse, a reverse most favored nation. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I guess it was uh, the best way I could describe it. And oh, so, yeah, no, no, absolutely. And so, and so that, that of course, is, is one of the concerns. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that really struck me about this is the fact that from a press point of view, you know, of course, here we're, 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 we're talking to journalists for the most part, but is the fact that last year when Spotify, with the whole Spotify debate happened, we're talking about, you know, artists speaking out against Spotify. It was a pretty small subsection of artists, but you got a huge amount of press. Uh, it was pretty much everywhere in the headlines. Lines. Uh, whilst uh, this particular case, uh, I'm not sure if it's because of uh, uh, the technicalities around it or because of the fact that Google is Google and people are kind of afraid to go against it. Uh, we haven't seen as many artists speak out or, uh, about it uh, outside of the you know uh, in labels uh, themselves and, and trade organizations, and we haven't seen it make as much noise in the press as perhaps one would have thought it, it, it would have. So, uh, the, why do you think that might be, and is it just the nature of the case and it a technical nature? Of it. I think on this case, uh, generally individuals, whether it's labeled or artists, are concerned to, to speak out. Yeah. They're concerned about, about retaliation. And even labels that have been very, very uh, vehement on other, other cases are, are not so public on, on this. And I think it's a very real concern about retaliation or about just taking a, a, an individual identifiable stance. Yeah. That's, I Helen, think I can um, understand that. It's, it's really weird because it sounds like um, we're talking about a dictatorship, a state of fear, uh, where people are afraid to voice their concern and so on. It, there's, there's something not normal there. There's something weird. Uh, does it, that mean that YouTube and Google have reached such a level of power that actually they are 
the Uber she- chiefs in the in the playground, and there's nothing we can do about it, and everybody's afraid of them. Uh, it, I mean, that 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 remains to be to to be, to be seen, seen whether yeah. yeah that's how how that story will evolve. But certainly, there are a lot of. Uh, there are a lot of complaints into the, the Commission and other regulators about Google generally, about its position in search, whether it is, is um, abusing a dominant position. Is it time for authorities to intervene on a more regulatory level? I mean, this, our case, is, I think, is very simple. Yeah. Uh, because it just deals with uh, a set of negotiations and an abuse of a, a dominant position. I mean, it's quite an easy case to handle from a competition perspective compared to some of these the, the other issues about whether or not uh, it is appropriate for one company to, to control so many points in the, in, in the online chain. I mean, we yeah. would agree that that's questionable. Um, but I think that's a separate debate to the, to the debate about... But YouTube, although the political context is very, very important. Yeah, exactly. And I, I'm kind of surprised that uh, uh, YouTube and Google let let this go this far, just because, you know, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Google is uh, being looked at uh, from a variety of angles uh, from mm. the European Commission. And mm. so just this is just kind of adding uh, another log to the fire uh, from, from their perspective, would Im- I would imagine, uh, as another example of, of something that uh, they're, uh, they're not too keen on, especially here in Europe. And, and Google, let's remember that it hasn't had its Microsoft moment yet in Europe. Europe, uh, you know, uh, we, we all know what happened to Microsoft in the in the 90s and, and early 2000s, and uh, 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 Google hasn't seen uh, that uh, level of scrutiny yet uh, in Europe, and but that they may be coming. And so uh, you uh, uh, requested for the European Commission to uh, take immediate action around around yeah. uh, this uh, complaint. And so, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what that immediate action may be, and also what the long term uh, resolution of this conflict might be if it was to be a uh, ruled by the European Commission. Uh, what's your okay. ideal scenario, essentially? Yeah, so I, ideally this summer the, the Commission would say, okay, uh, we think it's serious. Uh, what we need to do is to preserve, protect competition while the investigation goes on. So therefore I agree, it's urgent. I need to put in place a, a set of measures, like a bit like an injunction if you go to court. Yeah. Um, and that would prevent YouTube from exercising the type of remedies that it has threatened in the press. So, for example, a couple of weeks ago, it appeared to say in, in the Financial Times that it would block content. Um, it certainly has issued termination notices already yeah. for, for labels. Um, some other labels, of course, have already signed because they, they were concerned about the, the pressure and they didn't want to be without an agreement. Yeah. So, for example, what we would be looking at is for the Commission to say, OK, um, you can't block content, you can't terminate people's contract and you can't apply those that have already been signed. And that's why we assess the other questions about whether or not uh, the, the terms are discriminatory and whether or not how you handle your content ID system is, uh, is it conforms to rules about companies being in a dominant position, because that's another element of the of the complaint. Absolutely, uh, David. Do you have anything to ask, Helen, uh, at all? <clears throat> I mean, um, I guess I don't understand how it's unfair competition if you could use seventy other uh, video yeah, services sure. on yeah. the yeah. internet. Um, yeah, it's not sh- like. You know, in, in America, we had antitrust laws that came out of railroad barons that locked up the country, and so there was only two ways to ship goods across the country, and that was pretty important. The nature of the internet is such that you could start YouTube, a YouTube tomorrow called ImpolaTube and yeah. put all your videos there, and people can go to it. So I'm, I'm not, I don't understand how it's unfair just because they're so big and they've won, you know, essentially that race. Yeah. Well, I think it's like, you know, the comparison you made about the railroad and there being two. I mean, this is like being one. There will always be competitors coming and going on the, uh, not, not necessarily on, on, on the outskirts, but there are, there are, there are alternatives, but they're not, they're not at all on the same scale, not by a, not by a long stretch. So the fact that there are other possibilities does not mean it's okay for the one that's in a dominant position to do to do what it likes and to undertake this kind of yeah, uh, see, I don't think approach. that metaphor equates because 
the way the railroads were laid out was you couldn't lay railroads right next to the existing railroads. We had to assign certain rights of yeah. way and only one company could end up running the railroad. The way it is now is anybody could lay a YouTube track next down, could, could set up a YouTube system and, and try to uh, attain some type of critical mass. It seems exactly. like I, yeah. you're mad that they won. Yeah, but the, you will you will get that. Maybe that will maybe that will be the, the case. But right now, that's not the. Oh, so everything's crumbling. That yeah. right now, that's not the case. Yeah, and absolutely. And there is no other service which touches. It's 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 not really. I, I, I think I think the comparison is is fair. It yeah. doesn't mean to say you want an alternative when when the railroads were were established. People didn't believe there would be an alternative in terms yeah. of travel, and, and it's, uh, but of course that will happen. And it's very much also nature of the difference between uh, U.S. and uh, uh, European antitrust laws and, and, uh, and how also mergers are handled. I mean, uh, when, we, when we look at the universal uh, acquisition of EMI uh, in the U.S., there were hardly any uh, uh, impositions uh, on the acquisition aside from this. Uh, where was there anything actually in the, from the U.S. front? I think it just, no. it just, it just got passed. There, was, there were no imposition on universal on, on things they had to do, whilst in, the, in, in, in Europe they had to abide by a certain uh, number of of, uh, of uh, conditions in order to be able to proceed with the acquisition. So I think there's actually an inherent uh, uh, difference in the systems uh, there, uh, which uh, uh, I think from a European perspective, the complaint makes a lot more sense, I guess, than from a, from a US one. Although I, th I do think that I, A2IM are trying to do something al along these yeah. lines uh, from, from an antitrust perspective. So we'll see how that, how that side of it goes. And uh, uh, the last thing I wanted to ask you was about the numbers. Uh, so uh, uh, even yesterday, there was a, an unnamed uh, a spokesperson uh, of, uh, yeah. YouTube that was quoted by the Death and Texas website. It's a shame they didn't really release the name of who, was, who they were talking to, but uh, they said that now they have signed 95% of the labels that they currently have yeah. deals with. Uh, and it just seems like a really strange figure to uh, hear uh, just because uh, it, it is a very high percentage and if uh, all the associations that have spoken out against this uh, and, and the labels behind them are uh, united on this then it, it doesn't seem to make any sense so what are you what, what's your take on those numbers and uh, and how much do you think it is being withdrawn at this point i mean i know you probably don't know exactly but just a yeah. I, I mean, we're just trying to work out what the numbers say because it's is it five percent of is it market share yeah, exactly. or is it 5% uh, in terms of numbers? I, I, it's not very clear. I think they started out saying it was 90. They had 90% coverage and then they had, and then all of a sudden the next day it was 95. I don't really know what those, what those, where those figures come from or what they represent. But from our perspective, we know that there's a, a whole community that's represented by Merlin, for example, that do not appear to, to have concluded a deal. We know there are others who are, are undecided. We know, that, we know that companies have felt they had to sign, and that's one of the reasons why the, the complaint asks for, the, for YouTube not to be enforcing those contracts if right. it considers that they were signed uh, illegally or if they were... Um, signed in circumstances that would mean that they would they would be invalid because exactly. they are abusing the dominant position. Now that makes a lot of sense. The 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 numbers I think I think a number of things to say about the the, the, the numbers. First of all, we know that eighty percent of the markets which uh, the majors have signed on terms which have bear no relation to these yep. terms. Okay. Then you have the <laughs> then you have the, the independent sector and how you and how you measure that. I mean, certainly that, that the number, as far as I know, just of 95% or only 5% can't be correct just simply on, on, on our knowledge of those right. labels we have not signed. Um, but uh, you yeah, know, all these, exactly. uh, Merlin, I think Merlin has, for example, released figures in the past about its, its market share on, on services and it certainly seems to be a lot higher than 5%. Exactly. And, it was, it was and they have labels so. who are outside the deal. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That, that market share was uh, was uh, hovering around the thirty yeah. percent mark, and so uh, it, for me, it was it was interesting to read those those numbers and, mm. and to try and extrapolate what uh, the context was. But of course, it wasn't really made that clear. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's the, I mean, it's super interesting, and uh, I really look forward to seeing what's what's going to happen in the next few weeks uh, uh, on this. Uh, uh, guys, did you have any final questions for Helen before I let her go? Yes, I do. Um, 
Helen, I'm sure you have yeah. measured that, but in case the European Commission says, no, there's no dominant position, therefore YouTube is perfectly entitled to ask for this kind of contract, what's going to happen next? I doubt that's going to happen. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? You're very All right, uh, if, if that happens, then there's going to be a mass revolt for a reform of competition. I mean, if, if competition law cannot step in in this type of case, then it kind of begs the question of, of why we have competition laws in the first place. Right. I mean, it's a very classic uh, abuse abuse case. But it, hopefully, the the the. the there will be a satisfactory outcome and, and YouTube will be disruptive and will consider a, a, a brand new remuneration system which equates uh, with the level of investment. So if we could see some kind of reflection of the 80% in terms of new releases in the remuneration terms, then that would be that would be interesting. And I think it would be quite fun if, uh, uh, as a result of the complaint, actually the European Commission asked uh, YouTube to uh, at least to disclose, uh, if not publicly, to the Commission uh, the uh, contracts that it signed with the majors to see what what kind of imbalance there is there and uh, what the difference is between the two contracts. Because I guess that's, that's what everybody is, is wondering now. Like, uh, you know, I guess you guys think that there is a deep imbalance, but I, I, don't, I, don't, I guess you're not privy to, the, to those contracts. So it's, uh, it's just a matter of guesswork right now. And hopefully with yes. the European Commission stepping in, will be able to uh, uh, shed a bit more clarity around that, uh, which would be good. Uh, well, Helen, it was uh, such a pleasure to have you on. And thank you. Uh, great to have you. Uh, thanks so much for your time. And uh, I'm sure we'll keep in touch as this case uh, continues yes. to unfold. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, have a pleasure. fantastic uh, evening. <laughs> and uh, thanks again. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye. It's a real pleasure uh, to bring in another guest. Uh, this week it's, uh, it's full of guests. And uh, we have uh, uh, Thomas Ford uh, coming on uh, from uh, uh, Sounddrop. Uh, uh, and uh, the company has just released a new uh, uh, product and he's going to tell us all about it. So hi, Thomas, and thanks for joining us. How's it going? Hey there. Nice to see you guys. How's the sound? It's perfect. Yeah, absolutely fine. Excellent. And uh, it's great to have you. So first of all, uh, uh, talk us through uh, the new product. Uh, uh, what's the name and what does it do? Sure. So well, let me just say, I caught the tail end of, of the conversation about YouTube, and I kind of wish I'd, I'd heard the rest of it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds pretty exciting. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, we're very eager to see some of the things that are happening there. So very Absolutely. interested, I should say. Um, so today, or I should say yesterday, yeah. uh, the day's blurring together with the launch, but uh, we released something called Show.co. And it's a big change from what we've had before. It doesn't... Uh, it doesn't replace, of course, what we've done with SoundDrop, but we're really trying to expand the toolkit that we offer to artists and labels. And a lot of what Show.co is, it's, it's really, it's the way we look at it is it's a modern marketing campaign tool for digital music. And it's based on all of the experiences that we've had helping artists and labels kind of connect with their fans through Spotify and Deezer. And how can we do that in a better way? So that's yeah. really what we end up creating. And how long have you been working on this? Well, I should say, really and truly, we've been working on the actual code of it for about the last six months. And really, um, going back to last October, trying to sort of put the idea all together and figure out what it's supposed to have. And I can say that what we've launched with is, uh, I think, a pretty pretty robust uh, solution for, for artists, sort of the indie artists, and for the all the way up to the majors. Um, but, but you know, this is really our, our first uh, our first step towards a really a really powerful and all encompassing B two B tool that yeah. we're putting together. That's very interesting. What's the, Sorry, go ahead. What's the consumer user experience? Is it like an app with uh, new releases in it? Well, actually, it's it's really designed. So what you'll get really it's a way to sort of I can almost say spit out marketing campaigns designed the way you want. So. If you want like a mini site that features your content, that's that's one output. If you want to create an embeddable widget, that's another output. And really, it's all about pairing your content with with the kind of fan activations that really matter to you. So if that's following an artist, uh, if it's uh, following on Spotify or SoundCloud or subscribing to the YouTube you know channel, 
all of those and more, you know, collecting emails or doing an email for download, all of those are in, in kind of the different conversion cards that we display alongside your content as the consumer is engaging. And, you know, I can, uh, I can send some screenshots of it, but it's, uh, I think it's actually a very compelling consumer experience, but it's in a label-friendly, artist-friendly way. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's quite it's really neat. I actually tried it out uh, this morning uh, and created a few cards as well, and it looks uh, really uh, slick when you're sharing it online. It actually appears uh, right off Twitter uh, too directly, uh, so you can play tracks uh, straight from there. And it's cool that you get the option as well of uploading it directly to the site or bringing it in from uh, the likes of SoundCloud. So you don't have to have it on SoundCloud. You can actually upload it uh, straight to the app. In a sense, it's kind of... I mean, uh, I, I might step on some toes saying this, but in a sense, it feels like... Uh, some of the th things that you're doing, uh, especially in terms of cards and, and the beautiful way in which it's implemented, it feels like a little bit like the direction the SoundCloud should have gone in <laughs> maybe a couple of years ago. But, uh, uh, you know, it's just uh, s such a nice experience. And I think uh, a lot of people are going to be compelled by that. Oh, well, thank you very much. I, you know, we're not doing this as a move against SoundCloud oh, no, because course, it's, very yeah. much, it's very much about how do you as an artist or a label, you know, create gravity around your content. And if that content is uploaded to us, we can do something with it. If it's a YouTube video, we can do something with it. And if it's SoundCloud uh, as an audio, we can, we can do something with, with that. So it's really about uh, being a good middleman yeah. uh, in between all of these different services. Yeah, sure. Emmanuel, do you have anything to ask uh, Thomas? No, it sounds interesting. I, I'll, I'll have to go and check on that. And so uh, and, uh, finally, Thomas, I just wanted to uh, close by talking about the developments at SoundDrop itself. So mm -hmm. uh, what's happening uh, with, with that service, of course, which is, uh, runs in parallel to Show.co, and what are the next developments on that front? So, well, basically, SoundDrop itself is still going strong. We actually right. just, just recently had uh, three of our largest ever events, including one that I'm probably not supposed to say, uh, you know, and, and, and sort of talk about, but one that actually crashed our service, which right. was sort of the first time that's, that's ever happened. Um, and that was, of course, uh, the, the uh, very uh, powerful uh, Demi Lovato, whose right. fans uh, were able to bring our, our service down. <laughs> uh, we really saw a scale of interactions that we'd never even uh, anticipated. You right. know, uh, we, we had something like 180,000 messages uh, in that in that window of time. So it was really quite a quite a dramatic uh, jump over what we were used to. And then we've also had uh, we had Cher Lloyd as well, which had you know 11, 12,000 people uh, in her room hanging out. So so SoundDrop itself has really continued to to kind of build on its its base. Yeah, and this is really us with Show.co trying to take it to, trying to just answer a lot of uh, a lot of the the things that labels have come to us to try to do in SoundDrop that we really couldn't do. Yeah, uh, and just expand the toolkit and try to give more tools for everybody. Nice, and uh, and our other two uh, final final question: Are the other two services going to be parallel, or will they will they crossroads at some point? Well, I think you're going to start to see some of the SoundDrop functionality make its way into Show.co. And I think so. I think essentially you'll you'll start to see that there's a solution where um, every single stream can happen in a monetized environment for fan right. engagement, and that would be the the core SoundDrop product. And then you're going to see a, a campaign tool that borrows some of the things we know uh, drive engagement and drive fan acquisition inside of uh, SoundDrop. You'll see that move over to Show.co. That's fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Thomas, for your time. And uh, again, uh, check out show.co and see uh, if uh, that's something that might be useful to you. Thanks so much. I appreciate you guys having me. It's great to have you. Uh, uh, moving on to talk about some, uh, some of the news of the week, uh, aside, of course, from uh, Impala, YouTube, and show.co, uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, uh, first of all, I guess uh, the best thing would be to talk about uh, Songza. Uh, that's probably the third biggest story of the week, or you know, probably the second biggest story of the week, to be honest. Uh, and uh, it's the fact that Songza will was acquired by Google. So uh, Songza, of course, uh, most listeners will be uh, aware of it being an internet radio service that operates in the US and Canada. It has uh, just over uh, 5 million uh, uh, active users, according to the uh, latest stats the company had released. And uh, uh, um, the acquisition was announced uh, both uh, by Songza and Google on their respective blogs. Uh, uh, but the New York Times uh, actually went further and quoted sources saying that uh, the acquisition price was $39 million, so well above the $15 million that were uh, initially uh, quoted by the New York Post in the uh, June, um, in the early June rumors that the the Post had. Uh 
reported on. And uh, so this would be a pretty good payday for investors who invested po- uh, around 6.7 million in, into the company so far with two rounds in 2011 and 2013. Uh, you know, there's a bunch of reasons why Google might want Songza. Of course, curation is uh, the first one. Uh, uh, they have a, a lot of uh, good playlists. They have good playlist uh, curators and, and a good team there. And uh, uh, also, it's an, it's an it's got a bunch of interesting uh, d- design features that Google might want to, uh, to implement. Uh, and uh, it also has some relationships with advertisers to create a, b- a branded playlists, so which could be interesting for, for Google, given that it's, uh, it's really an advertising-based company. So, uh, guys, what, what are your thoughts on this acquisition? Uh, David, uh, uh, did you expect uh, this to actually uh, come through after the initial rumors? And uh, how do you think that Google can utilize Songza uh, uh, aside from uh, essentially taking parts of it and implementing them on, on its various different music services? Yeah, I mean, some people compare to Google now to um, the South Park Trapper Keeper episode, and it's just sort of hoovering up all the technology and all the creative it can sort of get its hands on that might in some way complement what it already does. And that sort of, this, this you know, sort of purchase fit into m- that framework for me of um, what Google's up to. They're going to do all those things that Songza song already does better, and they're, they're I don't know if they're going to strip the company for parts and just put everybody where they need to be or um, keep song, songs are running as is, but um, they're clearly um, seeing the value in music and music searches and, and uh, this whole space. And, um, and they got them for a steal. $39 million is like pennies to Google. Right, exactly. Uh, from your perspective, did, did, did you see songs are being able to grow much beyond what it was doing today? And, and if not, is that why you think the company is hard to sell? Yeah, I mean, I feel bad for anybody in the internet radio space right now with Spotify's lead. I mean, you talk about a dominant player, um, you know, and then you, you had RDO is something else we were supposed to talk about yeah, um, this course. week. And, uh, you know, 5 million active users is, is uh, I mean, there's more YouTube videos with 5 million active, active users right now. So right. it was definitely time to um, do something, you know, <laughs> take yeah, a bunch of It felt like the growth people. had kind of, had gone to a, a, a grow, a grown very quickly, but it, it didn't seem to be able to grow much more beyond that uh, on its own. And, and Pandora is what seventy million monthly active users now, so it's it's so much bigger. Which, which sorry, which service? Pandora, Pandora is around seventy million. Oh, seventeen million now. Yeah. So yeah. It's, uh, it's, you know, uh, I can't even do the math on that. It's 14 times more. <laughs> did, you, did you get any sense of the intellectual property Google gets from Songza in terms of patents or anything useful? I didn't, I can't re- recall reading anything in terms of filings uh, or reading mm-hmm. about Songza actually holding patents on its technology. It may well be that they do, uh, mm-hmm. but, you know, it was, I, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't be able to, to tell, to be honest. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, Emmanuel, on your front, of course, it's a U.S. service, but uh, from what you've been able to, to gauge uh, around Songza, uh, why do you think Google wanted the service? Well, uh, 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 there's one thing which kind of amuses me with Google, with all its power and all the brains that it has, you know, somewhere in the San Francisco Bay, uh, still needs to acquire companies that have stuff that they are not uh, doing internally, or yeah. that will take too much time to to build internally. So I find it quite interesting that they go for for those kind of things. Well, I think what they have acquired is experience, uh, databases, uh, uh, and you know a handful of uh, subscriber, which is you know always useful. Uh, the other remark I would make is that there has been an acceleration in the past three to five to six months in the streaming audio uh, area and I think the, the f- I, I, I don't know if it's really related to that but the fact that we've been witnessing a drop in download sales in right. the US but also in most European countries I think has really triggered I think the move from all the guys from Amazon to Google to Apple doing you know buying beats and so on and that that has gone in a you know very speedy way and I really think that now everything 
2014 is going to be a, a very exciting year, and we're already halfway through. Yeah. When it comes to to streaming, because I think the configuration of the market will be completely different by the time we get to 2015. Yes, Spotify will still be there, but there will be a, a bunch of other players, and this is where both the future of the music industry is, and also the future of a lot of these services is in 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 streaming. But also, it's not simply streaming. We can all stream. This is not you know. It's not that difficult. Is you know, is the environment that you provide and the consumer experience that you will provide with curation and all that and all the things that go with it. Yeah. And I think we are at the beginning. I think it's step two, of you know, it's 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 streaming audio 2.0, and we're moving into a completely brand new direction. I don't know if you know in the U.S. if you have that 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 feeling, but this is the feeling I get here. Yeah. You know, and the fact, yeah, for example, I would amplify. That, what you were saying, Look, in, in Sweden, I went to, there was a, an, Andrea, you were there last week at the MPA GM in the UK, and Spotify, you know, made, a, did a presentation, but what is interesting is Sweden, for example, 95% of digital revenues come from streaming, 5% from downloads, so we are really in a shifting market, and, and it's, it's going very, very fast at the moment. Yeah. Uh, uh, David, you were adding something, sorry, I... Yeah, I just wanted to amplify uh, what Emmanuel was saying. It seems like we are clearly in an inflection point now. Everybody was wondering when this was going to happen. And I'm, I'm sure um, Google, Amazon, um, you name it, was keeping a close eye on this and, and uh, preparing to jump in when the inflection point was reached. Yeah. Um, I mean, as I recall, Amazon launched a Me Too music service, streaming service, or is, is planning on doing that. Um, it's like all these big companies are now going to have their own version of Spotify <laughs> as just part of the jewels in their crown, you know, like, um, it's, it's, and it's going to be a competition. Like we've moved past version 1.0, which is yay. We can stream yeah. to version 2.0, which is who streams the best, who actually curates the best, you know, who, um, who works the best with the labels and with, with advertisers, and uh, that that might be what this songs of things about. Yeah, and uh, we're talking about inflection points. Uh, another company that has uh, was featured in the headlines this week and that hadn't been featured for uh, a little while is uh, Ardio, as the company announced the acquisition of a small startup uh, uh, focused on cura uh, on curation and discovery called Tastemaker X. So the startup only had a, a team of seven, but the CEO Mark Ruxin will become Ardio's new COO, and the entire team will move over to Ardio to bring the Tastemaker X experience to the service. So uh, what does the company do? So uh, the company focuses on allowing users to create collections of their favorite artists, adding music videos, photos, concerts, and more to create a musical history that includes uh, uh, lots of real-life moments. So think of, uh, for example, song kicks uh, features around uh, being able to add uh, uh, photos from, from concerts and, and uh, uh, imagine that in the context of your own record collection. So uh, it's interesting to see if Audio was able to integrate this technology as part of its own service, uh, allowing users to build a more personal relationship with the service that could be quite compelling but um, in a, on a more broader sense uh, it kind of showcases the fact that audio uh, continues to be a company that has the resources to make acquisitions you know it's been making interesting moves it acquired the troubled Indian streaming service Dingana uh, uh, just a few months ago it's just on a big partnership with the Shaw Communications in Canada and so even though we're not hearing much from audio really lately uh, it does feel like investors uh, you know of course principal investor uh, Janus Fries uh, from Skype uh, is uh, are still still believe in the service and want to keep uh, uh, pumping resources into it uh, what I'm wondering is uh, how is Audio planning to really expand beyond its current hardcore audience, which is a lot of techies, a lot of people, I think, in, in the Bay Area and in New York that I know love Audio, but uh, it hasn't reached the mainstream yet. So how is it, is it going to do that? And can Tastemaker X help them uh, get there? Uh, Emmanuel, do you have any, any thoughts on Audio and, and where they're heading? Well, I, was the, the, I was looking at Tastemaker X, and it's an interesting feature. Uh, which uh, I like. I like the fact that it's it's it was built by guys who come from the NR side of the music industry, not the business side or the legal side, uh, nor the tech side. And and so it's it's a very human uh, project. And RDO as a, as a as a service, I thought has always been very interesting. 
uh, and you know they have grown into I think they're into 60 countries or something like that these days they're at a slow pace you know without making too much noise but you know building up something so I don't know if you know the end the end result is to be sold for a few gazillion or billion pounds to Apple or Amazon or whoever but I, I think it is a good addition to what they're already doing and providing a service that will be probably slightly different than what Spotify can offer or you know which you know, in my belief at the moment, curation on Spotify is not very good, or what yeah. Beats can, op- can offer, you know, re- you know, in its new incarnation under the Apple, uh, you know, branding. Yeah, yeah. Uh, David, uh, what are your thoughts on Ardy, of course, being in the U.S.? Uh, uh, you know, the company has is, is, got a pretty big base there, uh, but uh, the momentum doesn't seem to be there right now. So what can the company do to improve that? Um, well, I mean, features is one. It's, again, in the streaming 2.0 world, it's not enough just to be able to get any song from the history of Western civilization wherever you want it, whenever you want it. Um, if Tastemaker X has this rich feature set, they could position themselves as being more than just music streaming, as being the sort of teenage bedroom of, of music where you're you're have your photos and you have your posters and you have all these um, little things that are wrapping around the core streaming experience that are hopefully going to keep allowing RDO to differentiate. Yeah. I mean, just because you're running in second or third place doesn't mean you shoot the horse. You know, you try to <laughs> try to catch up or pass them or, or, or lap them or, or cut, you know, take a shortcut. And it's, it's, uh, it's great to see that competition and I'm definitely going to check it out. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I would be uh, really happy to see uh, Ardio uh, pick a momentum, uh, but especially in the UK, I just haven't seen a whole lot happening around the company. I just, uh, uh, hopefully they have stuff in the works and there's going to be uh, more news from them soon. And uh, I wanted, I, I guess, uh, the next story, that is, it's, it's a big story just because of the implications of it, but uh, SoundCloud released a completely revamped uh, uh, mobile app. So essentially that's the port of call uh, for users on iOS and Android that want to listen to to uh, tracks on SoundCloud. Uh, the uh, app uh, has been completely changed. Uh, it's been redesigned uh, to focus on listeners rather than creators. The uh, record button, which I would, had been pushed quite heavily when the first app came out, is gone. It's completely disappeared and it's been replaced by a very slick uh, looking feed uh, showcasing uh, all the tracks by artists that uh, uh, or, or uh, creators uh, uh, that you follow on the service. And also you're able to browse through, I think I counted, it was about 50 categories uh, in both uh, the uh, types of music genres and also types of audio content whether news based or uh, tech based or anything like that because they do have a lot of audio content on SoundCloud as well these days and so uh, unfortunately I, I mean that the, the app was initially praised for this in, in innovative design and uh, uh, you know it, it's really snappy it's, it looks great but there's been a big backlash from creators uh, who uh, you know are feeling left behind by the company and uh, uh, you know if the change feels quite sudden for them uh, quite a few of the uh, uh, ways to act upon your your audio uh, on, in the previous apps uh, in the previous app are gone and uh, which actually prompted Hypot to headline their piece uh, 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 SoundCloud throws out the baby with the bathwater with a question mark at the end um, so of course, you know, uh, SoundCloud could have maybe done better by having a separate creator app uh, prepared to launch alongside the, this redesign so that, you know, it could have avoided perhaps this backlash. But we're not talking about a huge company uh, here. It's it's still a relatively small uh, team and, uh, per- you know, it had to pick its battles and obviously growing the listener base and making sure they stay engaged with the company was the priority number one for them. Uh, David, uh, what are your thoughts on the redesign? And uh, uh, do you think that uh, uh, this backlash from the creators will have any impact whatsoever on, on the on the overall scheme of things for for soundcloud um i have a lot of thoughts on it i'm a heavy soundcloud user i'm a heavy soundcloud enabled creator you know i like have a band i play with and we love to just record yeah um interesting ideas with soundcloud and um I didn't really follow the um, update and my phone automatically updated and so I went to jam session and I went to hit record and I was like, what is wrong with the SoundCloud app? And um, I feel like, you know, in 2014, that's a really common feeling. Uh, They change things and they don't tell you and you're confused and mad. And um, I'm trying not to just be an old curmudgeon and being like, why did they change it? I like the old version, you know, like, like um, you know, give them a chance. 
uh, try to see where they're coming from and a adapt a little because this is the nature of the game now is right. you wake up in the morning and all of apps are different because they updated them overnight. And um, so, you know, digging in that just real, real briefly, you know, with the record issue, SoundCloud put a post on their blog about how, hey, if you want to record, use this app that um, is a companion app. Um, it's, I think, by the same people who make uh, uh, Tabletop, which right. is like a sort of tablet um, audio creation environment. And so, you know, right then and there, I downloaded the Tabletop's, you know, the company's uh, record thing, and, and, you know, it loaded, and I signed in through SoundCloud, and I was back to posting to my SoundCloud account within a minute. Yeah. Um, I haven't had a chance to dig, dig into to the other features or really that long, but I was able as a re as a creator to adapt to the new SoundCloud within literally 60 seconds or two minutes, you know, with a right. Wi-Fi connection to download a companion record app. Um, SoundCloud needs to focus. They're flailing a little bit. They, you know, they're clearly trying to take a stab at being one thing, and it's clearly a huge pivot to, like, go from being this record-centric app to being this sit-back and listen app. Um, I don't know if it's going to work for them, but they have to try something. And it sounds like they're taking this approach where, like, we're going to do this, and we're such a big platform that other people are going to have the incentive to do some of our other features and probably do them better than we do them. Yeah. I'm also getting the impression that people are getting impatient with SoundCloud's inability to make money. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely. But that's something that, 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 that they're certainly working on, and, and they know they need to, they need to, uh, you know, figure out in, in the next uh, sort of six uh, to six to twelve months uh, at the very latest. Uh, Emmanuel, on your front, uh, uh, you know, uh, what, what, how do you feel about uh, SoundCloud's shift to listeners uh, from being a creator-centric app? Uh, and uh, uh, you know, on that front, uh, uh, how how could that impact the service? Well, the first thing is, uh, while David was talking, I went on to my, uh, my phone app, and uh, I, which David Downs are you? Number 12, number 16, number 1, number 21, 13? Oh, uh, on, on SoundCloud? I'm not on there. I have a secret jam band name. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> anyway, my Do you want the name? My, I'll tell you afterwards. <laughs> okay. My, my thoughts were... Uh, you know, SoundCloud is, is a fantastic anomaly in today's world in the sense that it is a widely recognized and used platform, yet it has not been licensed by anyone. Neither record companies nor collecting rights management societies, uh, music publishers, etc. Which is quite fascinating when you think about the clout, <laughs> no pun intended, that SoundCloud has. Uh, in the, in the in the mu on the music side, and I think one of the reasons was that they were really helping artists and musicians. The moment you start switching to something that looks more like streaming audio, or you know, a tool for consumers rather than a tool for uh, artists, I think they're going to enter into a, a cloud in which they will be asked. You know, to you know, to pay their dues, i.e., to be licensed, and I think that's that that might be the next step, and you know, it might be a bit, of, uh, probably a dangerous one for them. Yeah, it's gonna be interesting. To see. I, I would, lo I, I, I'm really excited about seeing how they're gonna uh, deal with this and how they're gonna ch manage the transition. And uh, I'm still very excited about the company, but uh, it's just a couple of the latest things uh, and the fact that the monetization puzzle is still completely to be figured out uh, are, are, are a little bit worrying, I guess. It sounds like we're seeing that uh, licensing issue come up too. Did you see that item that Andrea shared, Emmanuel, about how Universal? has uh, right. unfettered access to the SoundCloud backend to just delist uh, songs that it says violates copyright. Yeah, I think that validates what I just said, is that, yes, yeah. people are starting to pay attention. And I, and I was wondering whether or not the end game for SoundCloud was to say, okay, we're going to shift a little bit so that we can be, uh, you know, we can make ourselves more acceptable to be acquired. And that might be also the end game. I don't know. Uh, but it, it yeah, is I mean, certainly a very risky one. I talked to some people who are inside SoundCloud, you know, and I don't think I am, you know, violating their confidence when I say that SoundCloud has copyright violation problems. 
Um, people can upload whatever mixes they want and uh, remixes and, um, you know, it's playing whack-a-mole trying to get them down. And SoundCloud claims that they have fingerprinting that they can check, but the fact that, you know, Universal has access to their back end to do what they want sort of confirms that those fingerprinting measures aren't clearly enough. Um, so, I mean, and... Uh, <laughs> I mean, that's another reason to take the record button or the upload button away. It's, it's a lot easier to police copyright violations when you don't let anybody upload anything. <laughs> yes, that's true. That's true. It's, uh, uh, but we'll see. We'll see what happens on that. And also, the the issue of the backhand access is something that I think is going to keep uh, keep coming back uh, because uh, um, there was a post on Boing Boing from by Cory Doctor on it, and I'm sure that's going to pick up some steam. And so, uh, um, I think we're going to see uh, a few more people weigh in on that in the next uh, few days. And uh, uh, I think at this point we should probably uh, draw the start on the show to a close. The last thing I wanted to ask you about, uh, uh, David, was uh, about the RIAA. Uh, 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 conversion rates uh, for gold and platinum records in the digital age. So uh, we saw a piece uh, last week that uh, established Katy Perry as uh, uh, the highest selling digital act in the history of gold and platinum. So uh, the singer racked up up, up to 70 million digital single certifications uh, 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 derived from 18 singles across her three albums amounting to 18 gold, 16 platinum and 56 multi-platinum uh, digital single awards. So uh, these actually, uh, the certifications combined that downloads and also on-demand streams which include YouTube streams so uh, this is uh, why the uh, count uh, of certifications is huge so high and it seems like essentially uh, acts that have been around for the last five years so uh, since YouTube has taken off uh, taken off have essentially overtaken uh, almost every single uh, uh, old timer act in terms of number of uh, platinum records uh, uh, accrued uh, which is kind of weird so uh, you know, I was wondering what your thoughts were on this. You know, are RAA certifications still relevant? Has the uh, uh, sort of uh, needle been skewed too much in favor of artists that are doing well on, on YouTube? And uh, uh, I guess there's nothing that can be done at this point. You know, the certification has been set and there's no going back. Yeah, I mean, it's a benchmark. You take it uh, with a grain of salt or maybe a little bit more than a grain of salt with a salt shaker of salt. But it's a, in a world where there are very few benchmarks like that, it retains some value up until this point. Yeah. Katy Perry is a ginormous artist, and she's done well at being ubiquitous. Yeah. And, uh, and she should be rewarded with uh, whatever sort of you know, manufactured accolades the industry has. I mean, yeah. you, we, we were talking earlier about how Prince or ACDC won't go digital. And, and so, you know, Katy Perry's platinum number of platinum singles should eclipse Prince. And Prince doesn't want to be on anybody's iPhone in the sub-Saharan African region. Yeah. It's how those people would be hearing Prince. They're not buying vinyl. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, the digital and mobile are, and streaming and defining um, formats of our time. And uh, it sounds like they'll work adapt to that a little. I'm sure they have their reasons. Yeah. And if they skew the platinum in favor of um, people who are, you know, up to date with the times, I think that's all the more reason to get yourself available there if you're Prince or any of these holdouts. I mean, I don't, I don't understand what they're gaining. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Emmanuel, on, on your front, uh, do you feel, you know, uh, we've seen the, uh, we talked about the fact that uh, in the UK, the official charts company is not counting uh, YouTube streams uh, against, uh, uh, you know, uh, th their uh, conversion, I guess, uh, equation to uh, equate 100 streams to, to a download. They are, they're only counting uh, streams from the likes of Spotify, Deezer, uh, and other on-demand streaming services. So uh, how do you feel about that? And do you feel like uh, YouTube should some, somehow be uh, counted towards uh, platinum certifications I in Europe too? Uh, I guess we'll get there. I don't know what the, the reason, I haven't spoken to anyone at the official chart company, the, 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 the reason why YouTube has not been integrated uh, or at the, with the, the BPI, uh, which is the, the British RIA. Uh, it's, it, as you said, it's a benchmark. As, as, you, know, it, it, you have to start somewhere. Uh, whether it's the right one or the or not, I don't know. But it's it, it's a fact that there's a lot of artists. You know, if Rihanna has three billion, uh, if not more, streams on uh, uh, on YouTube. That has to count at some point. Yeah. And you know, then you know, you 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 use whatever you know formula you can find that you know makes sense. You know, a hundred. You know, is a hundred streams worth a download? Uh, 
you know, songwriters will tell you probably not in terms of revenues. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you you have to set set a benchmark. I think it's a good idea. I think it it will change uh, the nature of you know the certification. My my issue is as uh, you know it, uh, as David said is that at some point we will probably have nothing but. Uh, the Rihannas of this world that are going to get that kind of exposure, and we know that even in the uh, in the uh, the digital world, uh, success goes to success and buzz goes to buzz. And I I fear that might that might isolate a little bit more the 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 mid range level of artists, you know, that the middle class and the lower class uh, who will never get there. Yeah, right. In terms well of visibility. Yeah, absolutely. But it's, it's definitely something to think about. And uh, uh, I uh, think at this point we should draw the show to a close. Uh, it's been fantastic. And thanks so much, guys, for your time. And of course, I would love to hear uh, what you're working on at the moment so that listeners can know about that as well. So, Emmanuel, anything that you'd like to plug or uh, something that you'd like to direct people to, even if it's just your, your, your website? Well, you can always go and check, you know, what's on my blog, which is Le Grand Network. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'm working on a certain number of, uh, I'm off to a conference like you, Andrea, I think, in, uh, in, uh, in August. Uh, that will be my next step uh, in Cologne. Yeah, uh, brand absolutely. Brand new conference, and that should be fun. And uh, working on, you know, panels at MAMA in France and also already panels at the, uh, the Eurosonic Nordeslag conference in January. Great. Uh, so there's plenty on the, uh, on, you know, to look forward to. But, you know, in the meantime, I'm going to go on holiday for a while yeah. <laughs> uh, and enjoy the sunshine. That's great. And of course, uh, uh, Manuel mentioned his website, which you can find at legrandnetwork.blogspot.co.uk. And he wrote a great piece on uh, Simon Napier Bell. Uh, uh, which I read over the weekend, and so I definitely recommend uh, people to go and check that out. And uh, uh, David, on your front, uh, where can people find your work, and what's what's the best way to get to know you better? Yeah, I would say to tell people to follow me on Twitter at davidrdown.com. Yeah, that's uh, the easiest place for me to post links to all my um, content. You know, I'm a full-time freelancer here in the Bay Area, covering not only art and technology but other issues as well. So I got a nice mix and. Um, you know, every week I interview electronic music artists for San Francisco Examiner, and uh, we talk a little bit about what they're uh, going to play in town that week, but we're also talking about the issues of the day, you yeah. know, uh, whether it be social media or what do. And then I'm going to continue to review um, music apps for Billboard magazine, and uh, right. you can find out when those reviews come out um, through my Twitter feed. So please follow me. That's awesome, and I will post uh, those links as well uh, on the show notes so people, people can go and check those out. And uh, again, thanks so much for your time, and thanks so much to my guests, uh, special guests that came on uh, this week. It was really good fun recording the show. Uh, you can find out more on digitalmusictrends.com. Make sure you also check out the DMT One to One show where I interview an interesting uh, uh, music company or digital music project every week. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a fantastic week, and until next time. Yeah.